Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and it's always a great thing to be alongside Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. It is dry July where tens of thousands of Australians give up booze for the month, including our very own Joe Stanley. How's that oh. one going for you, Joe? I'm not sure who told you that. <laughs> I have good sources, Joe. <laughs> I, I won't pretend that I am doing dry July at all. Really? Well, maybe you might consider you it. Put me in it there. I'm sorry. Uh, I am very passionate about supporting my friends who are doing dry July. And, of course, you know, the best thing is you can buy people a golden ticket for only $25, which gives them a night off for a special occasion. And it is my birthday in July, so I often am buying many, <laughs> many golden tickets for my friends, and it's all for a good cause, which, of course, is raising money for cancer. I can't believe how successful this has been. People must really want, not you, but people yeah. must really want a break from the booze. Since 2008, Dry July has raised $90 million. Yeah, it's really impressive, Jake. And as you know, the idea that occasional drinking is good for you went years ago. So think what the health benefits are of a whole month off the grog. Joe. Well, July is a very busy month. There's a lot happening. And when I say July, I mean July, E-Y-E, -E, because it's also Check Your Eyes Month, which kind of sits well alongside banning the booze for a month. Yeah, because according to the World Health Organisation, around 80% of all the eye problems around the world could be prevented or treated. And that's just by maintaining good eye health. And, Nick, that is our focus for today, pun intended. We're going to have a look at how <laughs> screen time is affecting our kids' vision. And Heinze gets a lesson in the eye-popping art of African drumming. <laughs> and Jade gives sports broadcaster Abby Jelmy a makeup masterclass for mums on the go. And, Dr Nick, they say alongside the brain, the eyes are the most complex organ in the human body. Uh, you're right, Dust, because each eyeball weighs only 28 grams but has 107 million light receptors and is estimated to be able to see 10 million colours. So wow. there is so much more to our peepers than meets the eye. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist it. If you'd asked me, what's the most active muscle in the human body? I'd, I'd have said the heart, which beats around 100,000 times every 24 hours. Hm, impressive. But it turns out, so are some other muscles. Just like the heart, you don't have to think about them. They just get on and do their job. I'm talking about the eyes. Read a book for an hour and your eyes move around 10,000 times, all coordinated by six little muscles. And don't worry, you don't have to go and do eye yoga to keep those little critters in shape. Eye muscles are over 100 times stronger than they need to be. So whether it's the House of Wellness magazine or War and Peace, they'll cope. The front of the eye is called the cornea, and here's a curious fact. Because it has to be transparent, it's the only part of the human body which does not have a blood supply. The world would look pretty weird if you were gazing through a maze of blood vessels all the time. So, how does the cornea get its oxygen? Directly from the air. Brilliant. Then there's the coloured part of the eye, the iris, which comes in a variety of shades, brown being the most common, followed by my eye colour, which is a sort of nothing very much grey. A fortunate 1% have what's called heterochromia, where the eyes are different colours, which can look amazing. Surrounded by the iris is the black hole at the centre that lets the light in, called the pupil. Now, in human beings, the pupil is round, but they also come in a variety of other shapes. What does a cat have in common with a crocodile? Vertical, slit-like pupils. Horses and hippos? Horizontal. Goats and sheep may only have four legs, but like an octopus, they have rectangular pupils. It's all about controlling how much light gets in and trying to see what you want to eat <laughs> and what's trying to eat you. <laughs> At the back of the eye is the engine of the visual system, the retina. Now, this may only be the size of a postage stamp, remember them, but it's ten layers are crammed with receptors and a heap of blood vessels. The first phone cameras had pretty low resolution, less than one megapixel, compared to modern ones which go up to 48 megapixels. Amazing! But not as amazing as the human eye, which can reach a whopping 576 megapixels. Hmm. So, nature wins. For now. Jack, it's been widely reported that legendary rocker David Bowie 
had two different coloured eyes. Well, it mm. turns out the story's a bit better than that. Yeah. He got into a fight over a girl in a bar, got punched in his left eye, leaving it permanently dilated, looking darker than his naturally bright blue right eye. What a true rock star story, Does Love David Bowie. Um, and on the show today, Dr Nick has had some fascinating insights into the eyes. And one of them is that half a million Aussies live with some form of blindness or low vision. And it got me thinking how difficult it must be to navigate life. Yeah, and I often look at people crossing roads these days, uh, Jack, with their head down in the phone, glued to it. You're swerving around people at times. Surprised more people aren't getting collected because we're so glued to our screens. So true. And it's not just an age thing, and it really does show you how addictive those screens are. Yeah, and we know about the negativity of too much screen time, especially for our yes. kids. But optometrists agree for all of us. We've got to get out in nature like you and I are today, Jack, <laughs> for the sake of our eyes. Myopia is a looming epidemic. We are talking about half the world's population being short-sighted by the year 2050. One-fifth of the world's population will have high myopia. And with high myopia comes a risk of permanent blindness from cataract, glaucoma and damage to the retina, which is the sensor layer at the back of the eye. Which is why optometrist Luke Arundel is focused on identifying short-sightedness early. Myopia is caused by three main things. It's the amount of near work or close focusing that kids do. It is the years that they spend in education and it's a lack of time being spent outside in bright light. When we think about it, if you can't see the board at school, obviously that's going to affect school grades. If you can't see, for instance, across an oval, that affects sports performance. And some researchers have even found that myopia, and particularly undiagnosed myopia, leads to a lower quality of life for these kids. Uh, they're missing out on a lot of what the world has to offer. Squinting, eye rubbing, bumping into things or complaining of headaches are telltale signs of myopia. But research shows that if kids spend two hours outside every day, it can delay the onset and progression of the condition. Other things that can help is breaks with screen work and, and reading books, so no more than half an hour at a time. We also suggest the elbow rule, so it's important not to be holding t things too close. So they simply put their fist on their uh, chin, uh, book or screen on their elbow, don't want them holding it any closer than that. The second part that's really important for parents to understand is that if their kids have been diagnosed with myopia, optometrists now have a range of of treatments um, and techniques that we can use to slow the progression of myopia. These things include uh, a medicated eye drop called atropine. We have specially designed contacts and glasses that use enhanced optics to change the way that light is focused on the back of the eye. So Grace, what kind of colours do you think you might want? Um, I think blue. Okay. Excellent. Kids often don't realise they have a vision problem. They just assume that everyone sees the world the same way that they do. And many don't realise that the world isn't supposed to be a blurry place. So it's really important for kids to be getting a check before school and then regularly as they progress through the school years so that we can detect myopia and lock it down before it starts to have those negative lifestyle effects. Jack, if you're anything like me, you might be wondering what to do with those used household batteries. Yes. Well, what tell I tell me. Well, <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> Let me tell you. What I do know is you don't put them in the bin because every year 1,000 fires are started at waste and recycling facilities because people are putting batteries in the red lid bin and in some cases even in the recycling bin. Okay, so there are lots of places to get rid of them, including large supermarkets and hardware stores. So think recycling. Just don't put them in the bin. We're back after this. You know, Das, I am lucky enough to have three very close friends who, you know, they would do anything for me, I would do anything for them, and I can tell them anything and everything. What a gift in life that is. When I think of the hundreds of people that we all know, if it came to an emergency, for me, it's probably the family first and foremost that I'd be calling on. 
And that is great for us and our hearts, Das, because three is the magic number of best friends a woman should have to reduce her risk of heart disease. And in men, your heart health benefits most from close ties to family. And the team at Monash University have been doing some research, Joe, into the links between social connection and cardiovascular health, and they found some really interesting differences between the genders. It's amazing. Women who have three or more very close friends that they can discuss private matters with comfortably cut cardiovascular risk by up to 30%. And for men, it's always, it seems, family over friendship. The risk reduces by 30% for men that have three to eight family members they could call on at a hard time. And there's that word again, Das, connection. It is just so critical and it's being linked more and more to heart health. Our own Luke Hines doesn't have any problems with connection and this week he's dancing to the beat of an African drum. It's well documented, listening to or moving to music can alleviate stress, boost brain function and even enhance immune health. But the power of rhythm and music goes far beyond the dance floor. Join me as I check out the therapeutic benefits of African drumming and if immersing yourself in these infectious rhythms can enhance your overall health and vitality. Oh, look, I believe deeply in the power of the drum uh, when you boil it down and sharing all the amazing benefits of the different applications of drumming and seeing that spread through, you know, schools and um, community groups. It's just such a powerful modality. It's great to see that being shared with so many people. And we're just going to get into a nice, simple groove, a little bit of bass, a little bit of tone. Follow me. Here we go. African drumming yeah, isn't it. just any type of drumming, is it? How is it uniquely different? Oh, well, the rhythms are unique. Uh, the polyrhythms are unique. The techniques are unique and the instrumentation is unique. So, you know, there's so many different drum styles around the world, so many different drum instruments around the world, but the, the sort of collection of West African drums, which have their own subgenres as well, uh, are quite particular and quite specific. So, you know, we love to revolve our drumming experiences around a djembe, which is, comes out of the Mande Empire back in the 13th century and spread through West Africa. And that, that drum itself has become very sort of prolific around the world in the, in the last couple of decades. Yeah, keeping that constant groove is one of the challenges. What happens? if someone gets out of key in the group. Well, the dunduns over here, they provide the rhythmic foundation, so you've got to lock back in with the dunduns. Okay. When the workshop starts, yep. you'll have someone playing the duns, and if you can just come back to that bass rhythm, then you'll be fine. How did you get introduced to it? I took a pilgrimage to West Africa in my mid-20s, uh, and I studied there for... Um, about three months solidly, and then I've been going back pretty much annually ever since. I think I fell in love with the drumming. Firstly, the complexity of the polyrhythm. It's such wonderful music, it's powerful music. There's, a, there's an energy to it which just hits you in so many different places of your body. But really the cultural context too, which is very profound, and I, I gravitated towards that as well. Do you need any musical experience? No. You do not need musical experience to be able to drum. That's the great thing about it. It's, it's, it's accessible very quickly. So you can get onto the drum with a good teacher, learn the techniques pretty quickly and get into a groove relatively quickly. Tell me then about the connection beyond music, because of course, when I hear drumming, I can hear a beat, yep. and it's lovely to listen to, mm -hmm. but it's more than that, isn't it? It is, I mean, making music, especially polyrhythmic music, is a very much a collaborative experience. So you, you come at it with a group of people and you're collaborating. So, and that's, that's a great sort of social connectivity piece, as well as lifting your own personal self-esteem. Great for your confidence to have that sense of achievement. Yeah. There's no doubt there's therapeutic benefits to drumming and, and great mindfulness um, results off the back of drumming. I mean, it's uplifting for your mood, 
and it releases something called the alpha state, which is this peaceful, calm place that we go to um, when we drum. It helps us balance our emotions and also it allows us to access our own self-creativity, which is a, a powerful thing. There's other cognitive benefits as well and physical benefits as well. Neurologically, you, you can you experience things. You know, there's neurological stimulation going on when you're drumming, which is great for your attention, your focus. And, the, you know, the physical motion of drumming is great for, you know, motor sensory things as well and um, dexterity, independence. <laughs> How important do you think community is in an activity like this? Oh, it's, it's hugely important. And it's, it's the reason why a lot of people do come to drum and do stay with drumming, because there's, there's that real social connectivity aspect to drumming. They say the drum unites, and it does. And it has that, that beautiful way of stripping back all those barriers, like age, uh, gender, ethnicity. When people come onto the drum, there is no barrier. We're all one, and the drum draws us in. <laughs> If someone told me yesterday I was going to get a workout from drumming, I never would have believed them. But that's what I love about the health and wellness space is that it's constantly challenging me to what I believe health and fitness is. Now, yeah, when it comes to fitness, the physicality of this had my arms burning and my abs switched on. But ultimately, isn't health about being happy? And well, with this African drumming, I felt nothing but happiness. But along with that, I felt community and connection. And I think that's what it's all about. If you're looking to move, but also think and feel, African drumming might just be for you. The countdown to the Paris Olympics is on and they're now just three weeks away. And if we're this excited, imagine how the athletes feel. Coming up, champion and hurdler Liz Clay sat down with Abby Holmes at the recent national championships in Adelaide. Well, Nick, today's focus has been on one of the most complex and I think fascinating human organs, the eyes. And they say the average 81-year-old has seen and processed 24 million images. It's true, Darson. Our eyes actually never stop working. They're receiving information 24-7. But they don't send that information to the brain. Uh, they do have a keep perceiving light, which is why we can be woken up in the morning by bright morning sunshine. And you were saying a little earlier that 80% uh, of eye and vision issues can either be avoided or potentially fixed, what's the key to eye health? Yeah, well, regular checks, absolutely. So make sure your prescription glasses are up to date. Uh, wear UV protected sunglasses, because funny enough, your eyeballs can also get sunburnt. Uh, healthy diet, great for everything, but really good for eyes, particularly leafy greens and oily fish. May have mentioned this before, don't smoke. Uh, smoking increases the risk of cataracts and also age-related macular degeneration. And finally, watch how much time you spend in front of screens, because more than two hours of continuous watching risks what's called digital eye strain, also known as computer vision syndrome. Well, Nick, the best way for me to stay off the screen and get outdoors has always been, and particularly with the kids, get out and play some sport. And Aussie Olympian Liz Clay agrees the champion hurdler is inspiring a next generation of athletes. And she caught up with her own Abby Holmes. It seems such a long time ago, Eugene, doesn't it now, those World Championships where it all went array for her with that big injury. I was in Eugene in 2022 at the World Championships in the heat and I had a fall and basically blew up my foot. Um, it was just shattered, lots of bones broken and um, dislocated. So had two surgeries to get it fixed and then, yeah, just a lengthy rehab process. I think in total took about a year to get up and running and hurdling again. And then I guess another like eight to 12 months, which we're still in now, mm. to get back to like career best form. So it's been it's been a long journey. So wait, Clay got up quickly, didn't she? She's gonna to lead to the first today oh with her though. Liz is having a really good run here at halfway. And it started with a lot of rest. But obviously me being hungry and resilient, I wanted to, you know, do as much as I can as soon as I could. So from the moment I was allowed, I was in the gym, on the bike, in the pool, and I was it was great. My team had this 
kind of six month plan with every week and the goals that we were trying to achieve every week and I just that was like my bible I just stuck to it and yeah at about the four month mark I could start uh running and well first learning to walk again and then running um and then introducing hurdling and then introducing a bit of speed I think it was hard because as a sprinter you it's great to be fit and you know do things on the bike and in the pool but nothing can replicate sprinting and running so um, that was as soon as we could run fast that's what we did and we focused on that brilliant way to start off Liz Clay's campaign here at the national championships today so, other than that a heap of foot exercises yeah. which are really tedious and just keeping general fitness and taking like quite a holistic approach just ticking every box as best we could take me back to a young Lizzie Clay or a dancer back yep. in the day yeah I did ballet yep. and tap from when I was like three until I was 18. Wow. And then I kind of had this moment in 2014, yeah, like 10 years ago, I'd made the world junior team and it was my second year in, at uni and I was still dancing and I basically made a decision of like whether I was going to go down the athletics path or down whatever the path was with dancing and modelling and that type of thing. And I just, um, you know, I'm such a competitor, so... Yeah, athletics took it for me and I, you know, didn't have the best year that year and I had a few tough years moving forward, but I eventually I'm glad I chose the athletics path because it's boded me well so far. What was it about hurdles, I guess, that really... Yeah, well, I did, um, I did little athletics from when I was young. I actually started because my brother was doing little athletics and I was sitting around waiting for him to finish on a Saturday morning so we could go to dancing. And one year I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to try it. Um, and at Little A's you try all the events. Mm. Um, and hurdles was the one, I think because of my dancing, I had good coordination, I had good rhythm. I wasn't like the fastest, but I was flexible and I was a good like jumper, I guess. So that's like what a mix of what hurdles is. So yeah, I think that was the thing that stuck by me. And I, it's also a challenge, like mm. hurdles is hard and <laughs> I love all the technical elements of it and putting it all together. When did you, I guess, realise that you were a promising junior, yes, but then started really clocking some pretty solid times? Um, well, I, at that 2014 World Juniors camp, um, one of the coaches there, just we had this long chat and she was just like, I know you're not where you want to be right now, but I just think you have so much potential and I really want you to stick it out. And, like, sometimes when you're a kid, that's all you yeah. need to hear is just one person to be like, you've got to just keep going. Um, so I just held on to that for like six years almost. Qualifying for your first Olympics in Tokyo. Second in your heat, third in the semi. You missed the final by 0 0.04 of a second. Yeah. But how, how did you enjoy your time over there and how hungry did it make you moving forward? Yeah, I think um, I just loved being amongst all of these athletes that I'd kind of thought were out of my league for the last few years and then you know I found myself walking around the village you know as one of them and it was a weird Olympics because there was no crowds and you didn't leave the village but yeah that was I had a few moments where I was like oh, I'm, he I'm finally here and I'm I'm doing the thing um, I'm a part of the team and then yeah after the semi I was distraught and Looking back, you know, I did a great job, but when you're in the moment, you just, and it was just that far away, I, like, you mm. always wanted more. It's probably a race into if you look at those heat runs, but as we know, anything can happen in a hurdles race. Away, so who's first to that first one? Probably Jenica, though Clay's right with her behind those shores. So at halfway, Clay, Jenica's shading her. So Michelle's... Michelle Jenica booked her ticket to Paris yesterday. How good is it within this Australian team to have that level of healthy competition that, I don't know, you can obviously work together, you compete against each other to get to the yeah. very best? It's perfect. You know, you always um, want to be competing against girls that are as fast as you or faster. And at the end of the day, where you want to be is in that top tier where you're running 12-4, 12-5, and the calibre of athletes that are going to be in that Olympic semi and Olympic final are in that range. So that's, that's what you've got to train and strive for. Eyes are extraordinary. They help us enjoy the beauty of our surroundings, 
process information, even communicate. We all know that person who can say a lot with just one look. And while keeping our eyes healthy is relatively straightforward, the more our lives move online, the bigger the impact on this important organ. Dry eye is a common yet debilitating condition that occurs when tears aren't able to provide adequate lubrication for the eyes due to a reduction in tear quality or quantity. Many who suffer experience something called evaporative dry eye, where a deficient lipid layer of the tear film results in increased tear evaporation. While ageing may make us more susceptible to dry eye, increased screen time can also be to blame. That's because staring at a screen for long periods can reduce your blink rate by up to 50%, causing tears to evaporate at a more rapid pace. Symptoms of dry eye vary from stinging, burning or itchy eyes, blurred vision, redness or tired eyes, as well as the sensation that something is in the eye. Nova Tears is specifically designed to help lubricate the eye and form a protective layer to reduce excessive tear evaporation affecting the majority of dry eye sufferers. It provides short-term relief, plus is clinically shown to improve the symptoms of dry eye in as little as two weeks. There's also Nova Tears Plus Omega-3, the only eye drop using plant-based omega-3 to help improve eye health. Both are preservative free, so there's less chance of irritation to already irritated eyes. When it comes to features of the face, the eyes are often the first thing we notice and taking care of their health helps ensure we can have many amazing connections and experiences in the future. Joe, drops are good to soothe the eyes, but there's actually an easy, natural way, and it's simply to blink more. Who knew? Well, the average person blinks 15 to 20 times a minute, but if you are reading a book or a computer or a phone, that's going to drop down to four times a minute. So, hello, dry eyes. Mm. Well, there's this thing called the 20-20 rule, and what it is is you take a 20-second break and you look into the distance and you do it every 20 minutes. You know, I would need to set myself an alarm to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree. And do you know what else is really interesting about blinking? Well, there's actually a scientifically proven rule about the perfect length of time to look into someone's eyes when you first meet them. It's four seconds or just long enough. Shall I do it now to you yes. to notice their eye colour? Well, I, I think <laughs> that perhaps it's about balance, right? You want to look at each other long enough to sort of establish that connection, but not so long that it... <laughs> becomes awkward. It's a bit creepy, actually. <laughs> well, when it comes to our makeup, here's Jade K. Whether you're into a smoky eye or more of a natural look, here's Jade K with some tips on how to do your makeup on the run. Must have made a wish on a star. My life is paradise and here we are. Abby, so happy to have you here. And I know that we have created over the last five years so many makeup beauty looks. So I probably can answer this myself. <laughs> but what is your signature makeup look? My signature glam is usually jade. What do you think? <laughs> Let's be You're honest. Too kind. I'm not someone that usually brings too much inspo to the table. But my day to day, I'm not breaking any rules, am I? I keep it. I keep it pretty straight up and down. I like something that's pretty classic, glowy and natural. We've done so many red carpet looks, best part of a decade. Which is one that really stands out to you? If I had to pick a favourite, last year's Logies was really special for me and I think it was about two months after I had Louis. So yes. I was a new mum and it was a, getting that confidence to be on a carpet and not knowing how I'd feel in front of camera. And I remember you just made me feel so comfortable in my skin. And I think that's the beauty of working with makeup and beauty is it can make you feel your best self. And you've just recently announced your second pregnancy. Now I know it hasn't been smooth sailing for you. So please only feel comfortable. What's happened to you in this first trimester? With me, um, pregnancy comes with a side of hyperemesis, which um, affects about one in a hundred pregnancies. Yep. And um, for me, it was actually hyperemesis gravidarum, which sounds like a Harry Potter spell it when really you say does. it quickly. Um, but it's essentially when the nausea and vomiting that comes from pregnancy is so debilitating that it's a health issue um, wow. and means that you can't live your daily life. And so. It was eight or nine weeks for me of not leaving bed. Um, yep. Hospital every second day for three litres of fluids. 
I couldn't wow. eat, I couldn't drink water without being sick, I couldn't take care of Louis, I, I, couldn't, wow. I couldn't do anything. So in that time it was, yeah, it was really challenging but you just have to keep your team around you and your family around you and also just put things in place to take care of yourself. Um, but that's my lesson at the moment is basically when Louis's down, just sit on the couch and that is self-care sometimes. Yeah. You're a journalist, podcaster and presenter, so a lot of what you do is facing a camera. How do you approach your makeup off duty? I'm a real tinted moisturiser gal because I just think sometimes it just warms you up a bit. I'm naturally super pale, so <laughs> if it can make you look like you're not the walking dead, that's half, <laughs> that's half the battle. So, but no, I'm, I'm pretty. If I'm just pumping around with a pram in the neighbourhood, you won't see too much on my face. <laughs> What we're doing here is a step that I think so many mums and so many people forget. And it's sculpting, contouring, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> this is always going to bring forward your features in a really positive way, I think. And make sure that you blend it into the neck or else you will have harsh line. It doesn't look like you've matched your skin correctly. And now, once you've mastered a quick contour, I think a step that is so important is blush. Yes. We love blush. Blush is having a moment again. We're going to either add that on with your finger. So the key is to keep your cheek blush application quite high. We've nailed the blush, the contour, <laughs> the last bit. You need those dry, tired lips. <laughs> we need to have a little bit of moisture and colour. It is. It smells a, nice. Does it? Mm. It's the Lava by Emco. So you can pop it on with or without lip liner. What's one thing that you think would surprise people about your beauty routine? I think how much I love it. Yeah. And how much I love skincare and beauty. And it's something that um, I'm in a very male dominated industry and working in sport. There are these archetypes of what a sports journalist is meant to be into. And for me, I think as you get older, you just you can only be the version of you that you are. And yeah. I've always loved makeup and it's an escape for me because it is so far from the what sporty life. So if anyone judges that accordingly, it's on them, not me. Yes. Thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. I'm, I don't know if I'm just more excited that we got to talk about makeup or the fact that both of us actually spared 10 minutes out of our busy routine that we could sit down, have a tea and just talk. Such a pleasure. And you've done so much for me over so many years that it was just a pleasure to be able to sit down and be any part of this and just really proud of you. Oh, you're so sweet. I love no, you. No, it's true, honey. Mwah. When it comes to the common cold or flu, there are plenty of old wives' tales out there. There are things like being cold gives you a cold or even starve a cold, feed a fever. And while some of these may be more myth than fact, there is one powerhouse nutrient, particularly important at this time of year, that is the real deal, vitamin C. Also called ascorbic acid, vitamin C is an antioxidant important for many different functions within the body. Minor wound healing, helping collagen formation, and what it's mostly known for, supporting healthy immune system function. Unlike most animals, humans can't produce vitamin C naturally. Since it also can't be stored in the body, regular intake is essential. The good news is, vitamin C is abundant in a variety of foods. Things like citrus fruits, red capsicum, strawberries, or even broccoli. Supplementation is also an option when dietary intake is inadequate. Introducing the new Vitamin C Chewables from the number one immunity brand, Synovus. The range includes fun new flavours like berry and lemon lime for adults, as well as lemonade and strawberry options for kids. They assist in supporting vitamin C within the normal range. They're also proudly made in Australia. While we can get distracted by wacky immunity hacks, remember, it's the simplest of daily habits that often help keep us feeling our best. Now, Joe, I know you're not that keen on gardening. No, I'm... Well, I'm not. I love looking at gardens, but for me, gardening always feels a little bit cold and damp. Yeah, well, here's something that might encourage you to get your hands dirty a bit more, because they've discovered a bug, which is a type of mycobacterium. Now, normally that group are associated with nasties, things like tuberculosis, leprosy, even the Borrelia ulcer. Mm -hmm. But this one is one of the good guys, because it helps us release serotonin, which, as you know, is our feel-good chemical. 
A study which was published in 2016 was named one of the top 10 achievements in mental health research because it might help pave the way for how this bug from the soil can help people with mental health issues. Well, that is amazing, because I do know that there are great benefits to putting your hands in the soil and getting dirty, aren't there? Yeah, and even better reason, Joe, is I know how you love the gut microbiome, yes. but we have a skin microbiome, and all that soil can help improve microbial diversity, which is great for things like allergies and the immune system. Well, two things that I do really love are fruit and vegetables, and with all this talk about eye health, Zoe has both absolutely covered with a beautiful salmon pasta that is chock full of veggies. Pasta is one of those staples that always delivers, but it doesn't take much to break from serving up your usual family favourite. Case in point, my roast broccoli, smoked salmon and pea pesto pasta, off the chart with flavour and goodness. Preheat the oven to 180 degrees Celsius. Slice the broccoli into small florets for easy roasting and eating. Salt and pepper are the staple seasonings, but cumin adds warmth and spice. Lather with extra virgin olive oil and toss together. And don't be afraid to use your hands. Broccoli is an easy addition to any dish and it comes with extra health perks. With key nutrients like vitamin C and iron. Roast for 30 minutes until the broccoli is a divine golden brown. Now for the pesto. Fresh or frozen peas will work well. Their earthy taste is offset by the punchy flavours of the other ingredients. Parmesan cheese, lemon juice and garlic. Raw cashews add thickness and just a hint of nuttiness. Puree the mix until smooth. I'm using buckwheat pasta as a healthy, gluten-free option. And smoked salmon delivers one of the few food sources of vitamin D. Roast broccoli can be added straight from the oven or after it's cooled and has a bit of crunch. The colour is a dead giveaway that this recipe is a healthy one. There's plenty of textures and flavours at play here, despite it being so simple to make. Pasta, friend, not foe. Get Nourished is brought to you by Superior Absorption Liposachets. Available in liposomal, vitamin C, D and iron. Put your vitamins to work with liposachets. Australia's number one liposomal vitamin brand. Well, we can't talk about the eyes here on the House of Wellness without talking about sleep. And, Doctor, you were saying earlier that the eyes never sleep. They're going 24-7. Yeah, so the eyes keep moving while we're asleep, but the brain isn't actually processing what they see. And, you know, funny enough, one of the best things we can do for eye health is get good sleep. Well, clinical sleep psychologist Dr Shelby Harris reckons that the key to a perfect night's sleep is knowing your sleep language. Now, we've spoken before about the five love languages. She has come up with the five sleep languages. That's right, Jo. So first up is the worry sleeper. This is 100% me. This is the person who lies awake all night and goes through their day and catastrophizes. 100% me. And then there's you, Dars, the gifted sleeper who falls asleep easily. Yeah, without any <laughs> conscience at all. Just <laughs> close the eyes and sleep. I love it. <laughs> and then there's the, what we call the routine perfectionist sleeper whose really rigid bedtime routine is essential for their sleep. But they're also prone to sleep-preventing anxiety. If that routine is interrupted. I've no idea who that might apply to. <laughs> and then there's the too hot to handle sleeper, which oh, no. is that, well, no, it's not what you're thinking. It's actually those people who are just throwing off the covers all night and waking up in a sweat. People who are going through menopause would know exactly what that is like. And then she mentions the light as a feather sleeper who's literally awake at the slightest noise I'm also or that. sound. A bit of that yeah. as well. What, which one are you, Joe? 
Well, I would say, like most women, I'm a light as a feather sleeper, which does feed into a worry sleeper. Mm. I think that's what women kind of juggle. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's all we've got time for today on The House of Wellness. Thanks to Dr Nick Carr, to Jackie Felgat and Joe Stanley. Make sure you check out The House of Wellness Radio every Sunday with Gerald Quigley and Luke Hines. And check out our latest lift out with Sprint star Tori Lewis on the cover. Thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. It's bye for now.